My name is Trevor Trinkano. I'm a quantitative trader down in Austin, Texas with Kirshner Trading Group. This is part two of our three-part webinar series on using machine learning for algorithmic development. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I mainly trade intraday. Um, all my models are driven by machine learning predictions. And then there's a lot of quantitative, kind of traditional quantitative research that goes on top of that. Um, to actually get our models live. Uh, in the first webinar, we kind of went over from a high level what machine learning is, why I use it, a couple of different types of machine learning algorithms, uh, but we didn't dive into any code. Today, I'm going to walk through similar steps to what we spoke about in the first, uh, first webinar, except I'm going to go through it in code. Everything's going to be done in Python. Um, that is kind of the one of the main, um, probably the main coding language for machine learning nowadays, just because it's so readable and there's some really great packages for it. Um, so if you're brand new to coding, looking to get into machine learning, I would highly recommend starting with Python. All right, here's a little risk disclaimer from FXCM. All right, so like I said, we are going to go through um, the preliminary, preliminary steps to create a machine learning algorithm or a prediction based on machine learnings um, prediction. And we will go through all the different steps that you need to do and then train our first model. We're going to see what sort of improvements machine learning get, up, get, get us. And then we're also going to start tuning um, some of the hyperparameters slightly to see um, to see what sort of improvements we can get there, but we'll get to that. All right, so I spoke about this quickly in the first webinar, but really all that machine learning is doing is just finding finding patterns within the data, and you are you know what you're doing is you're setting up an equation or an algorithm and tuning the settings of that algorithm to allow the machine to effectively search through a lot of data and find patterns. So with that in mind, um, you know, everything really comes down to data and everything comes down to what sort of features or variables you've created, um, you know, and how, how you've kind of pre-processed your data before you feed it into the machine learning algorithm. If you're gonna, you, know, you can't just download a bunch of random data on a um, you know on a stock or a stock's movement and expect that to be able to get you you know get you the results you're looking for um, you really you know you really need to spend some time kind of thinking about what your setup is and what sort of data is going to be applicable to that setup and we'll go through briefly at the end here as well how you can kind of use the machine to help guide that process a little bit. Um, all right, so we're going to work with Random Forest today. They are um, basically just a group of decision trees, and they're one of the easiest and most powerful machine learning algorithms to use right off the bat. So I would highly recommend um, starting there if you haven't done anything with machine learning. And then from there, we're also going to either in this video or the next video, um, start looking at gradient boosted decision trees, which are a slightly more powerful algorithm that um, minimize a loss function from the previous decision tree to build the upcoming one. And then we're also going to look into neural nets and specifically in the next video, for those of you who are familiar with neural nets, we will go over um, an LSTM model and kind of compare the results. So different types of machine learning algorithms need different types of data and are able to work with data in different ways. Um, you know, decision trees inherently cannot engineer features. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you give it data, it's going to find patterns within that data and it's going to find, you know, combinations of different variables to create nested if statements. And, you know, it can find dependencies on variable X 
and variable Y and variable Z so that it gets you, you know, your optimal outcome. That being said, it's not, it does not have the ability to combine variable X with variable Y, you know, in some unique way to kind of create a new variable. And that is where, you know, that's what neural nets can do. And that's why neural nets um, are so popular and so powerful is that they can inherently do feature engineering within, um, within their structure. So, you know, all a decision tree is going to do is say you have a variable that is your percent change since open. It is going to look through that variable and all the different, you know, say you've got 100,000 trades. It's going to look at every possible threshold of that variable. You know, so say our percent change from open ranges from 5% down to negative 5%. And, you know, obviously if we've got 100,000 trades, there's going to be more or less 100,000 different thresholds in there because it's on a continuous scale. Um, and then, let's see, we're s someone is saying they cannot see the screen. Hold on real quick. Um, okay, if you cannot see the screen, can you shoot me another question real quick? Um, and if you can, can see it, then um, it would be great to be able to know that as well. Um, okay, it looks like some people can see it. Um, okay. Cannot see, okay, we're having half and half. Um, all right, let me know if that's any better for people. Um, okay, until then, we're going to kind of plow through. Okay, so anyway, so we've got our percent change since open. We've got potentially 100,000 different thresholds. The random forest machine or decision tree is going to look through each one of those different thresholds and find the threshold or split that is most optimal um, to gain information. And it's going to use a um, formula called cross entropy, which basically means, you know, if we've got, if we've got 10 original samples and we say, say we split on um, change since open is greater than negative 3%. And there's only one variable or one trade that has a change since open that is less than um, less than negative three percent. You know, then our our machine is going to split the data such that one node has that single variable and the other node has all nine variables, and most likely has not gained too much information there because we've still got a large batch of nine variables over here, and. You know, but if it were to split the data such that we are, you know, everything that has had a greater than 1% change from open goes to the left, everything else goes to the right, and we potentially get six trades in our left node and four trades in our right node, then, you know, and say that we've labeled these trades such that the six trades in our left node, five out of them are, are good trades, you know, then we've gained more information there. So... In general, what a decision tree is going to do is going to go through and create these nested if statements to try and split your data in a way that is most use useful and gains the most information. Um, a neural network, like I said, can kind of create combinations of features um, using weights and biases and these things called activation fun functions. Um, and then from there, it can kind of create more variables on top of the variables it created. Um, okay, so that's why they're so powerful. Um, and probably in the third webinar, we'll get into some code on how to do that. Uh, okay, next part, normalized scaling and centering data. So you really, when you're thinking about this from a purely data standpoint and from you know the machine standpoint, you know, if you say that, if you're saying what is the absolute price change since yesterday's close? 
that piece of data is going to be massively different for a stock like Amazon versus a stock like Bank of America. So if we're saying the you know price change since yesterday's close is ten dollars for a stock like Bank of America, that is massive. Um, you know, so a stock like Bank of America, ten ten dollar move, that's going to be almost a thirty three percent move or a thirty percent move, whereas Amazon, that's going to be you know less than a one percent move. So what we need to do to kind of allow allow the machine to find patterns within the data is we need to kind of normalize this data. Um, you know, we need to like right here we've got you know say the opening price was twenty dollars before yesterday's closing price not normalized. If we were to say the opening price was two percent below yesterday's closing price, that would be normalized. Um, you know, in that case, the you know the value for Amazon is going to relate properly to the value for um, for Bank of America, and because of that, our machine is able to find similar patterns in that feature or that variable across different price scales um, because we've normalized it. Okay, and then scaling. Um, you know, for for neural nets, we need to um, we need to scale our data down to. I mean, most of the time we go mean of zero, variance of one. I'm um, just doing like standard distribution. Other times we'll maybe want the variables to be bound between zero and one for a range. Um, for decision trees, you do not need to do that because they are just finding thresholds. Um, so so it doesn't matter if the variable has been scaled or not, it's still gonna be able to find the same thresholds. For a neural net, because you're combining these variables through weight matrices, if you have too large of absolute values in your variables, um, you're gonna run to this problem called the exploding gradient, and um, it's not gonna work very well. Okay, so on to the next thing. We're going to jump into a Jupyter Notebook now. Um, and I will pull it up here. This is just a regular old, um, blow the screen up a little bit. Um, so this is just a regular Jupyter Notebook. Um, this is some data that I have pulled out of CloudQuant, which is our kind of internal back testing engine here. And it allows you to, it allows anyone, um, this is to basically go on cloudquant.com, create a um, script here or a model, and then backtest that model back to the beginning of 2011. And what it also allows you to do is when you backtest, it allows you to um, collect a lot of data. So what I'm loading in here is just a CSV file from um, one of the backtests that I have, you know, basically, one of these over here, you can go download trades as CSV, um, and it's going to pull out all of your trades, and it's going to include all of the data that you asked it to collect. So this is an example of a back test that I ran before using machine learning um, just to collect data, just by doing this download trades as CSV. And if anyone has any questions regarding CloudQuant, um, you know, go to cloudquant.com, look in the documentation, and it'll kind of give you an idea of what our system is built around and how to use it. Um, I will also include my uh, my contact information at the end of this end of this presentation, so that you can um, shoot me any questions if you have them. Um, okay, so. Back to this, this is just a trade to CSV file. We are working on shortly um, something called CloudQuant AI, which is going to, it's basically our own um, version of Jupyter here, and it's gonna be our own kind of Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Lab that is going to allow any researchers um, direct access to tick minute and daily bar data for every US equity since the beginning of 2011. Um, this is updated for every change in the national best bid, best offer. Uh, we also have a technical TA lib uh, library. We've got a bunch of alternative sentiment data sets, um, Morningstar data, imbalance data, 
all that stuff, and you're going to be able to kind of go onto this CloudQuant AI and directly access that data, so then you can do more research in here. Um, but like I said, it's under development. So right now we're just collecting data, kind of the traditional way I've been doing it through CloudQuant and then downloading this trades as CSV. And again, uh, if you have any questions there, uh, shoot me a message. But anyway, so just to get an idea of what we're looking at here, um, again, all of this is in Python. And our data here is basically each one of these rows is corresponding to a symbol and an entry time. And we have, you know, different um, different variables in here. So if we want to take a look real quick, we can go you know, so these are all different variables. You know, so I've got this variable name D1W3, um, which has this value for this symbol at this time. Um, you know, it's more or less just a, a standard CSV file. As you can see here, it's GAP ATR. Um, pretty easy to kind of infer what that is. You know, this is just the, the change um, from today's open, today's open minus yesterday's close um, divided by the ATR. Um, had a question quickly, what is Jupyter? So Jupyter is just a, a way to kind of do research very easily. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, I would recommend going to Google and just saying um, download Anaconda. It is a really nice Python data science library and kind of package that you can download um, and allows you to jump in here and kind of go through a Python script step by step so you can iterate over your process and do a lot of research really easily. So, all right, um, so here's kind of just a look at some of our data. We can look at some of our columns in here. Uh, we've got about 203, so I've collected um, 203 different variables more or less. Um, I have kind of predefined which features are most important for this entry signal. Um, and a little bit to back up here, what this entry signal is, is it is basically we're asking or we're telling the model to collect data if a trade or a stock has moved down or had descending closing prices for the previous three days. And then um, on that fourth day or whichever day it is after that has happened, um, we're forcing the stock to have moved down 150% of the ATR. And at that point, we st I started to collect data. So this is, you know, stocks that have really, really been beat down and we're looking to fade the position and buy it and kind of come back up. Um, and this is actually a model that I run live right now. And through a process that I'll kind of get to later on in this webinar, um, I've created these 50 variables or so that I have found to be most important to kind of split the data, um, split the data usefully. So here's our list of features. Um, you can see these top ones are, these are more or less to do with time. So they are kind of measuring in some sense the, the slope that the stock's, the stock's price has and um, relative changes in that slope. Um, you know, if it's kind of, concaving down, um, if it's accelerating at some point, things like that. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff that has to do with volume in here as well. Um, so, you know, creating geometric features to kind of best describe the stock's movement and then combining those geometric features with uh, volume indicators relative to that same kind of time period has been where I've found the most success as far as creating features. Um, all right, so a couple checks to do, uh, and I will, I will put, this, um, put this notebook on cloudquant.com with the uh, recording of this video, so people can go in and download this and kind of run through, um, run through all these steps and use it in your own research just to have a baseline. Um, but right here, we're just checking to make sure that each one of these 50 features is of type float, which just means that it is a, um, you know, if we look something like that, one is going to be an integer, um, 1.0 is going to be a float. And if you're unfamiliar with Python, when you're doing 
data analysis. Um, if you divide two integers by each other, they're just going to round to the floor of that operation, um, which is not going to get you the precision you want. So you want everything to basically be of type float so that you can uh, get the most accurate values. And then here we're just checking for if there's anything that is greater than 95% null. Obviously, if we've created a feature and we've gathered our data and greater than 95% of the values are non-existent, then we've probably, you know, we probably have a bug somewhere back in CloudQuant here and we've collected data improperly. We would probably want to go back over here and figure out what's going on there. Um, so we're checking for that. Here we're just checking for if greater than 95% of the values are equal to zero. Um, obviously don't want that as well. Um, here we're kind of just printing out the percent of unique values. Don't really need to do that, but can be useful. All right, so getting to the machine learning part. So what we need to do, we're working with um, classifiers. There are a couple different types of machine learning algorithms. We've got supervised, we've got unsupervised. Um, supervised machine learning algorithms are where we have a set of data and then we label each points, you know, every one of those data points as either good or bad based on some criteria that we've specified. Unsupervised is where we give the machine that set of data without any labels and more or less just tell it to go find patterns for us. So it might find clusters, um, it may find correlations, you know, things of that sort. Um, but we're going to be working with supervised machine learning. So we're going to take every single one of our trades and we're going to label each trade as either good or bad. And from that, we can tell the machine to, we can tell our decision tree to search through every single one of those variables and split on the most optimal threshold to um, to most intelligently split our data such that in every node at the bottom of our decision trees, we have the purest groups of good and bad trades. You know, obviously we're trying to create rule sets that give us all good trades or all bad trades. So we can then save those as a rule set. And, you know, when we see that data coming in in the future, we can then analyze, oh, based on this rule set and based on this data, you know, we've got a really good chance of this being a good trade. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do here is because this is, you know, we're fading this really um, beat up stock, I'm going to try and my max return um, kind of variable that I'm creating here is just going to be the high that is seen after our potential entry um, divided by this variable is just rec representing the daily move. So we're trying to kind of see if, see if we can find trades and tell the machine to find trades that have rebounded greater than 40% of our daily move. And, you know, right here, our label, um, again, we're just saying if it has rebounded greater than 40% of the daily move, then we're going to mark it as a one. And if it hasn't, then we're going to mark it as a zero. So now what we've got is, you know, we've got this for every one of our data pieces. Um, we have now kind of labeled whether or not, you know, so EW on this one. I will include one other thing here. Um, so EW, you know, on April 4th, 2011, at this entry time, it did rebound greater than 40% of our daily range. Um, you know, so this is basically what we're doing here. So you can see it actually rebounded 120%, you know, so that was a great trade. This one only rebounded 26%. We're not gonna label it as a one, we're gonna label it as a zero. So we kind of go through this for every single one of our trades. So now we can tell the machine to find patterns um, to effectively split based on this label. All right, here we're just checking to see, we've got around 27% of our initial um, 308,000 trades that are positive or that we're trying to find. All right, so this next piece, um, we are in machine learning and in any general quant analysis, you know, or <clears throat> any signal processing, you need to 
you need to split your data up into different train tests and then even validation sets. Uh, we spoke about this quite a bit in the first webinar. So if you want to really dive in, I'd recommend going and looking back at that. Um, basically, what we're doing here is we're going to specify from 2014 to January 1st, 2017. We're going to use all of that data to train the machine learning algorithm. So it's going to, that's the data it's going to look at and it's going to find its patterns. It's going to create its nested rules or if statements off of. And then we're going to save all the data from January 1st, 2017 on in a different set. And we're going to kind of see how well those rules work in this out of sample data. You know, if we didn't do this, then there's no way for us to judge how good our machine is actually predicting um, any of these values because you know if, if we trained on 2014 to present and then we tested on 2017 to present we're going to get extremely biased results um, because obviously the machine has already learned from data we're telling it to predict so what we're doing here like I said, we're just splitting based on time frames um, so we can accurately test how good our machine learning predictor is doing. Um, this is just some kind of simple Python code that is saying we're going to, in this X train object, that's going to be basically our training data frame, you know, so our, all the data from 2014 to 2017, uh, but it's just going to be these 50 features up here that. I have previously defined as being important to this. And then this Y train is going to be the same time frame, except it's just going to be our label. So just these zero or ones. So this is going to be kind of, you know, this is going to be what it learns from. This is going to be what it's trying to split on. And then in the future, for our test time frame, this is going to be what it predicts on. And this is what we're going to use to um, validate how well it did. So we can do this here. Uh, we can see that we have about 150,000 in our training set. Normally for random forest and decision trees, I'd like to have, you know, ideally if you could have 100,000 trades to do your analysis on, that would be, that's probably best. Um, you know, at least 100,000, the more data, the better. For neural nets, you need, you need more than that for sure. Um, you know, I think for most of my neural net stuff, I will, try and have half a million to a million different trades. Um, all right, so down here we are, um, this function is basically just taking any NAND value we do have in our data set and replacing it with the median of that feature. So say back up here for one of these, for this M gap, um, for some reason the data wasn't available or was faulty for 10% of our trades and it popped out as a null value. When the machine goes to try and split on that, it doesn't know what to do. Um, you know, it can't effectively split on a threshold if the value is null. So what we need to do, or what we're going to do here, is we are replacing that null value in M gap with the median for M gap. Um, you know, and you can do, you can replace it with the mean if you'd like, um, you can replace it with zero, you know, it probably it probably makes sense to go through, you know, right now we're just kind of creating a generic rule set to replace everything with the median. If you were actually doing this in practice, it would probably make more sense to go through each variable and understand what would be the uh, most effective kind of null value replacement um, for each variable. Okay, and then from there, we are just going to basically tell it to take this X train, which is our 2014 to 2017 data um, with just all of our 50 features, go through, find the medians of each different variable, replace all the null values, and kind of transform that data set. And then down here, we're just going to take all the medians that we got in our, um, in our X train and apply those to the X test as well. So all the medians we got from 2014 to 2017, we're going to apply to 2017 um, looking forward as well. Uh, we don't want to do fit transform on this because it would then find new medians for this entire um, 
2017 onward period. And in real life, that would be impossible to do because we would not be able to look forward into the future and find the median. So this is just kind of simulating what we'd actually be doing in real life. Um, all right, so like I said, we're going to use random forest. This is a, you know, we're importing this from a Python library called scikit-learn, which was developed by Google. Um, really great library, especially for just starting out. Um, definitely where I would point everyone. And um, at the end of this webinar, I'll include some books and material that you can kind of go reference and take a look at so you can go um, do some of your own research after this. Um, another way, I mean, you can just uh, Google SKLR and Random Forest Classifier. Um, they've got great documentation, kind of explain what every, you know, every different setting or hyperparameter is doing. Um, you know, really great documentation. So what we're going to do here is we're just creating a random forest classifier object, and we're not passing in anything to the function. Um, ignore this for right now. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, so we're just taking whatever the kind of default values are for this random forest classifier, and um, by doing this dot fit, we are telling it to find patterns in our X train data set that allow it to split based on that Y train label most effectively. So if we do this real quick, um, should run fairly quickly. Um, for neural nets and some larger data sets, sometimes it can take you know hours, days um, to train your classifier. But um, for a simple random forest with only 300,000 or 150,000 trades, um, it's pretty quick. So here what we're doing, we've basically told it with this fit function, we've told it to go through and find the patterns and create our nested rules. So now this little CLF object has saved in its memory all of our nested if statements. And if we do this dot predict, we're telling it to take those rules that it has saved and that it found from our X train data and now look at all this new data that it's never seen and based on those rules assign either a zero or a one trying to you know match the label that it trained on back here. So if we go through here um, we're going to see that out of our we've got 69,000 trades approximately in our testing data set, and it has predicted around 11 to 12,000 as positive. Um, you know, initially, if we look back up here, we've got 27% of our trades are actually positive or actually ones, you know, so we're a little bit less than that. But hopefully, by doing this, uh, you know, hopefully we have split the data in some way such that we have gained some sort of edge. So here what I'm doing is basically just assigning this prediction to our test data set and then filtering down our test data set so that we're only including uh, the predictions that are greater than 0 0.5 or you know, equal to 1, basically. Um, so we go through here. This is just going to be a, a quick little um, description of our max return variable. So if we look initially in the 69,000 trades that we had without using any machine learning, the average max return was about 0.3. Um, so on average, every stock had rebounded about 30% of its daily range at some point in the day. You know, so this is not this is not the end of the day. This is its absolute maximum bounce. Um, so with machine learning, we've narrowed it down. You know, we only have 11,000 trades instead of 69,000, but we're now getting on average 45%. So it's clearly done its job, and we've more or less done no work at all. We've just kind of plug and played um, with this simple out-of-the-box random forest classifier, and we're seeing some dramatic improvements here. Um, you know, obviously, it would be nice if we had 20,000 trades that re rebounded 45%, but that is a trade-off we have in machine learning, is the more specific and accurate you want a classifier to get, the, in general, the less, um, you know, it's going, it's going to miss a lot of the good trades. 
by doing that. You know, so you're going to tell it to by adjusting some of these different um, settings in here that we'll go over in a little bit. You can tell it to be more specific or less specific. And what you're really doing is telling it, giving it the freedom to either fit your training data more or less. Um, you know, and ideally you'd like it to fit your training data and find the patterns in your training data such that if it were to predict that training data, it would have a similar prediction rate to what it's doing on the testing data. But obviously it's seen your training data before already, so it's, it's going to predict more accurately there. Um, but yeah, so getting back to this, we could, we could probably adjust some of these hyperparameters in here and we could get it to be 20,000 trades with only a 40% bounce. Or we could adjust some of these hyperparameters and have it be 5,000 trades with a 50% bounce, you know, things of that nature. Um, and that's kind of the trade-off you have to find or define in your problem. Um, yeah. So now we're just going to kind of graph our equity curves. You know, again, we're telling the machine to find the maximum bounce. Right now, when I collected my data, this uh, we're basically just holding to the end of the day and then exiting at the close. So by telling the machine to find the maximum bounce, we're not explicitly telling it to find the most profit um, because we obviously have to do some more work on the exit to kind of capture that, that maximum bounce in some sense. But we can see you know, our original P&L curve here isn't very good. With the machine learning, um, you know, we're dramatically better. Obviously not very pretty still, but um, definitely an improvement. So if we go back up here, what I have here is just kind of some different, um, some different hyperparameters, and all that hyperparameters really are are they're just they're just adjustments to the algorithm or different settings that we can pass into this random forest classifier class uh, that is going to create a slightly different version of it, and it's going to learn in a slightly different way. So, what this is, what we're saying here, n estimators equals 200. So we're going to create 200 decision trees and we're going to combine them all and to make our to make our rule set and to make our final prediction. With the random forest classifier, when we make, you know, when we have multiple decision trees, it takes a subset of our trades and then also a subset of the features to build each decision tree separately. Um, so say we've got, you know, we've got 150,000 trades in our training data set. We've got 50 features. For one decision tree, it will do around, it'll take around seven of these features. Um, I think it defaults to the square root of the number. Um, so it's going to take around seven of these features, and it may take only 50,000 trades into consideration. And then for the next decision tree, it's going to take a different seven features and a different 50,000 trades. And it's going to kind of mix and match and randomly sample. Um, from our features and from our trades to create slightly different rule sets and slightly different models. And then from there, it's going to combine all those 200 decision trees that have created rules based on slightly different trades, slightly different features. And it's going to kind of average out, um, average when we ask it to do this predict over here, it's going to average the results from all of those 200 different decision trees to get our final probability or prediction state, which is one of the reasons why random forests are so robust to overfitting and why they're so powerful right out of the gate is because by using um, this method called bootstrapping where we, you know, we kind of randomly sample from from the trades and from the features and we're back, you know, putting these into different bags and creating different machine learning decision trees off of them. You know, it's finding all these patterns we want to still, but it's not, it's not going to overfit the data nearly as badly as some of the more powerful algorithms. Um, all right. So our max depth equal to 10 here. That is basically just saying that we can create 10 different if statements in a row. So it can be, if we feed it a trade, it could find a rule, a rule set that's saying, you know, if our V daily range, or let's see, if our M gap is greater than two, 
our high last T is less than one, our A vol is greater than 500,000, our M week three range ATR is less than 2.2, you know, all the way down for, you know, it can have 10 levels. So we went through about five right there, um, but at maximum it could have 10 kind of if statements before it has to stop. You know, and you could, you could imagine that if we did something like two, you know, all that's going to allow it to do is two if statements. So that's going to really kind of limit its ability to fit the data. So we're probably going to, you know, we're going to fit our training data less. We're going to find less complex patterns, but we're also going to be at less of a risk to overfit our data. Um, our max leaf nodes is basically saying, you know, every time when we split the data once, we get two leaf nodes, and then we split the data again, we have four, split the data again, we have eight, split the data again, we have 16. Um, you know, this is saying that we're going to allow it to have a maximum of 100. So based on this, um, you know, we're not going to, two to the power of 10 is much larger than 100. Um, you know, so we're not, every single rule set is not going to go down to the maximum depth of 10 because we've limited the number of maximum leaf nodes in some sense. And then this end jobs minus one is just telling it to run on all the uh, cores that my computer has and the verbose equals one is just a, uh, just so we can kind of print its progress. And we're going to run that for a second. Um, over here, you know, you can see there are a bunch of other different hyperparameters that you can go in and play around with. Um, I'd recommend just jumping in here and taking a look at what each one of these are and Googling it. I mean, there's so, there's so much information out there and so many learning resources available to you online nowadays. Um, you, can, you can pick this up pretty easily by either getting a free class or paying for a you know, five or $10 class on Udemy or Udacity. Um, okay, so we've now got our new random forest classifier, which is a slightly different variation from our first one. Um, we can see that if we go down here, okay, so now we only have 7,000 trades. So we're becoming a little bit more specific in some sense. Uh, hopefully we get better than a 45% uh, max return. Okay, and you can see that we get a 52% max return. So we have, you know, we're taking less trades, but we've become more specific. We're getting better results in general. Um, you know, in general for trading, obviously it depends on the type of model that you're doing and the goal you're trying to get out of the machine learning classifier and everything. But for me personally, you know, I would much rather have over a one and a half year period. If I have 7,000 trades, that's plenty. Um, you know, if I have 7,000 trades and I've increased the maximum return um, by 7%, then that is worth it to me. Um, that's probably where I would kind of err on this trade-off. Um, and obviously I would do a lot more research on these different hyperparameters here to kind of see what my results are. Um, if we go down and we plot this, oh yeah, so we can see, again, our PNL curve is not great by any means, but it is, you know, dramatically better than if we didn't use any machine learning. Um, all right, so that is, I mean, that is basically the quick and dirty, just kind of running through getting our data from CloudQuant, you know, as we're collecting it here, going into our, you know, we run a back test, we download our trades as CSV, we then load our trades in as a CSV file here, we make sure our data looks correct, and, you know, we define what features we want the data to find patterns in, you know, make sure everything is good, we label our data, um, split it, clean and standardize it, and then run it. And we're getting pretty great results. Um, this is, you know, there's a lot of work that has gone into this behind the scenes here, um, mainly finding these variables. Uh, you know, it's not, you couldn't just, I would say it's gonna be very unlikely that you can get a trade set up and go capture 50 variables that you just think are kind of related to the setup and, you know, do the bare minimum amount of work that we've done here and get an equity curve that looks halfway decent. Um, you know, there's a lot of, 
a lot of work that needs to be done into kind of finding these features. And something that's really nice with the random forest is that it allows you to rank each feature by its feature importance. And this is basically just ranking each feature by the, you know, all these feature, all these float numbers here add up to one. Um, but it's ranking it by the, you know, the total information gain at every split throughout every one of our 200 decision trees. And, um, you know, adding that up for each feature. So obviously our mins, whatever this variable is, again, this is one of those geometric variables um, multiplied, one of the relative geometric variables I created multiplied by some relative volume metric is very important. Um, this one is as well. This high, I believe this is like the high of the day minus the last, um, and I think it's timestamp, um, something like that. So, you know, a lot of these, I think actually these top five are all, top six are all to do with time and volume combined in them. Um, but what you can do here is you can, you know, you can start with 50 features or 100 or 200 features that you think are applicable to a trade setup, run it through this process, rank them, and then filter down those 100 or 200 features down to the top 50, top 20, top 30, you know, you can try different levels and see what's important and then go back, you know, go back into cloud quant or go back into wherever you're collecting your data and create more features either similar to the ones that are really important or you can try and look at, look at what these features are and intuitively think, you know, ah, maybe there's this, maybe there's this feature X or this other type of variable that I haven't thought of yet. You know, it's not in my top list. I think it could be important. So I'm going to go try it and run through this process and see, you know, see what I get. You know, it's definitely a very, um, very iterative process. And there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into creating these features. I would say probably close to 80% of my research is solely focused on creating these features and making sure that they are applicable to the setup that I am trying to predict. Um, you know, and then after that 80% of that work is done, I would say there's another, you know, probably the other 20% is done by trying out different combinations of these hyperparameters here. Um, I mean, you can, if we think about it very simply, you can do something really simple like for, max depth in range two to 20. You know, you could do something like that and then you could take your classifier here, paste it in there, and all this is going to do is it's going to kind of create 18 different random forest classifiers with a max depth ranging from two to 19. Um, you know, and you can you can kind of go through this process with all those different ones and see what your results are and, you know, decide on an optimal max depth based on your results. And then from there, you know, you can add a second for loop, you know, for um, max leaf nodes in range, uh, you know, 20 to 1,000 with a 20 step. Um, you know, and then put this right in there. So now you're creating, but you can, you can see now that you're going to begin to create hundreds, you know, and soon thousands of different random forest classifiers here. And that's going to take a lot of computing time. So there are ways to go about trying different combinations of these more effectively. Um, you know, you can research that if you'd like. I'm happy to talk about it more if you shoot me an email after this. Um, I use a genetic algorithm, which basically goes through and tries out different combinations of these things, and then will create new combinations based on the successful previous combinations. So it'll kind of mix and match um, successful previous combinations, um, among a few other things that it's doing. But in general, that is, you know, that's kind of what we've, you know, what you need to do. Um, again, I would stress finding these features is going to be 
where all the magic happens for sure. Um, all right, so back over to our, you know, again, talking about CloudQuant AI, the idea what we're trying to get, you know, have happen here is you can, you can run a back test, you can collect your data or come up with a hypothesis for an algorithm in CloudQuant here, run it and then have that immediately connect to, um, connect to CloudQuant AI, which is going to look similar to a Jupyter Hub type setup like this. And then, you know, you'll be able to access all of your back test data, all of our tick volume price data. Um, I think there was a question earlier around what type of um, indicators, you know, technical indicators we have. Um, if you go into our documentation here, you can see we've got the whole TA lib library. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff in here. Um, Bollinger bands, you know, basically everything you could, you know, everything you could need is in here. Um, and I do, I personally, I will try almost all of them um, and I'll end up probably using, I mean, if we go back over here, Let's see, so I'm using the um, daily Tima uh, multiplied by the, you know, this stochastic uh, variable right here. Um, so I will, I will use them. Um, down here we've got the EMA, um, beta, you know, so I will use some TA lib or some um, technical indicators, but most of the time they are combined with other technical indicators or changes in the technical indicators over time. Um, all right, and then down here, um, here are just further questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me. This is my email right here. Um, again, cloudquant.com is kind of where I do all my research, where all the other internal quants here do all the research, where we collect all of our data, and where you can kind of go to start playing around with this stuff, um, and then bring your data into a Jupyter notebook like this, or down the road, our cloudquant AI platform and begin to do some research. Um, and I will, if anyone has any questions, I'll kind of start going through the questions now. Um, again, this is Kirshner Trading, is our kind of parent company. Um, machine learning textbook, this is a great, doesn't have anything to do with financial markets, but if you want an overview of how to do machine learning and the different types of machine learning algorithms, this is the best book I've found. And then this machine learning for algo development, um, this is kind of the one and only of its type where it applies machine learning techniques specifically to financial markets and um, algo development. And then from there, online classes, you know, you can find everything online nowadays. All right, so I'm gonna go up and start at the top of these questions here. All right. Okay, so Python has a lot of library. Do some kind of mining. Um, so as far as libraries that I'm using, um, you know, in Python, you're definitely going to use pandas and you're definitely going to use NumPy. Those are kind of the two um, data science libraries that you need to be familiar with. Uh, Matplotlib allows us to kind of visualize our data a little bit nicer down here. Um, Scikit-learn, like I said, is if you're just getting into machine learning, spend your time in Scikit-learn. Um, it is the most user-friendly, easiest, you know, the API is really intuitive and um, it has more or less everything you need until, unless you want to get into some deep learning. Um, and reinforcement, you know, some things that are a little bit more advanced. Um, but as far as the library you need to focus on, scikit-learn, stay there. Um, this is, again, the documentation. It's great, developed by Google. Um, you know, from there, we, you know, I use a model called LightGBM, which is a gradient boosted decision tree, which we will go over in the third webinar, um, as well as some neural net stuff. But more or less, it's just a, you know, it's just a different implementation of something that Scikit-Learn has already that runs quite a bit quicker and allows me to adjust it um, in some more robust ways. So, but once again, you know, when I was first learning, I spent all my time in Scikit-Learn for probably the first six months, 
and then started looking at things like LightGBM or XGBoost um, for those of you who have some familiarity with it. Um, books, yeah, so like I said, these are the two. This is the first book I would recommend. Um, everything is done in Python in both these books. If you've never coded Python before, I would recommend going to um, learnpython.org. It is a free tutorial that kind of gives you the base of what you're going to need. And then from there, either going to um, Udemy or Udacity or Coursera. Um, Data Camp is another one that I've heard is pretty good. Um, you know, it's, Python's a pretty intuitive language. You'll be able to pick it up in a few weeks to a couple months. Yeah, so we'll get into, um, so the question was, you know, how do you place an automated trade? And does the classifier do that? And yes, it does. So we'll, we'll get into this in the, in the third webinar. I'll go into, you know, how we actually pull this little classifier object right here that we've created back into CloudQuant or into a live trading environment and have it, you know, have it help us in our trading moving forward. But more or less, if we look at what, you know, X test is here. Um, oh. If we look at X test here, um, you know, this is each one of these rows is just associated with a, with a symbol on a certain day. And, you know, in our live trading environment, what we're going to basically do is as some criteria is hit, you know, for this model, it would be the previous three days of close prices are descending and it's moved greater than 150% of the ATR down since the open. You know, as soon as that criteria is hit, we're going to capture all of this data at that instantaneous moment and then feed it back into our classifier here or just basically tell the classifier to predict this one row. And it's going to give us a zero or one prediction or we could even do, we can do something, um, we can do predict proba here, which basically allows it to, it doesn't spit out a zero or one, it spits out the probability of it being a one, you know, so it would spit out a 0.6 or a 0.65. And from there we can decide to take trades if it has predicted greater than 0.6 or if it's predicted a one, um, if that makes sense. But we'll kind of get into what that actually looks like in the third webinar. Um, there will be a recording of this, and I will include this Jupyter Notebook as well um, on CloudQuant's website. If you just go to the normal, uh, well, I'm inside the portal right now, um, but if you go to cloudquant.com, this will be posted in the press area um, with this with this uh, Jupyter Notebook so you guys can download it and start messing around. Obviously, um, you know, these features, you're going to have to create your own and have your own kind of file here. Um, but hopefully this allows you to walk through and kind of start to get your hands dirty and play around with it a little bit more. Um, and then this will also be, I'm sure FXCM is going to post this somewhere as well and on their YouTube channel. Um, uh, okay, so the next, there's a question about um, a machine learning algorithm called principal component analysis, uh, which basically what it does, it's a, it's a linear transformation of your data into a smaller dimension. <clears throat> so what that means is, you know, right here, I've got 50 variables or 50 features. Um, so my data is, you know, has dimensionality of 50. And a lot of times, you know, one of the greatest things about machine learning and why it can be so powerful compared to just a normal human is that machines can understand patterns in these higher dimensional spaces. You know, we can really only kind of begin to comprehend two, three, maybe 4D, um, you know, but machines can really find data in higher dimensional spaces. That being said, a lot of times you have, if you have too many variables or too many features, you know, say you have 200 here, um, it does, it can make it harder for the machine to have the most accurate predictions. 
Um, so what principal component analysis does is through creating um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues, it kind of, eh, I'm not going to explain it too thoroughly, but it combines, it would combine these 50 variables into potentially 10 new variables that are just ranked, um, ranked projections of kind of, it's going to, it's going to try and create variables that capture all the variance in these initial variables. So it's going to take these 50 and it's going to create 20 new variables over here. And by doing that, you know, the very first variable it's going to do is going to try and capture as much variance as it possibly can in these 50. And then the second variable is going to capture as much variance as it can, um, you know, in these 50 that was not captured in the first. And again, that's all done through eigenvalues and eigenvectors for people who understand linear algebra. Um, really interesting. I would uh, definitely take a look into it if you're curious. Um, I have experimented with PCA quite a bit, and in some of my models, I do use it. Um, I also use it, you know, it's helpful to allow your machine to kind of train quicker because you're now training it on 20 variables instead of 50 variables per se. Um, so it's a lot, it's able to, you know, you're able to do research and train your classifier much quicker. Um, so yes, I will do it. Um, what I have kind of been using more recently or more of my um, research has been focused around autoencoders or nonlinear transformations, um, just because I've found that a lot of the dependencies in my data is not linear, um, but similar similar kind of process. Can you post the first recording? Um, yeah, so the first the first recording is posted on CloudQuant um, in here, and it's also on FXCM um, somewhere as well. Um, so you can take a look at it there. Again, we kind of just went over a high level, you know, high level. What is machine learning? Why I use it? and all of those things. Um, and yeah, and then um, I am not going to be covering how to use FXCM's Python API um, in these videos. We're just kind of focusing on machine learning and what, you know, how you can start to think about creating an algorithm based on a machine learner's prediction. All right, that is all the questions I have here. Um, again, if anyone has other questions that pop up or they're curious, here's all the contact information. Um, you know, and I would say just go out and if you don't know Python, don't be daunted. It's pretty easy to pick up. Um, you know, and from there, it's really, really easy to pick up at least the basis of the machine learning stuff from online classes. And uh, yeah, shoot me questions if you have anything. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next webinar, which I believe is on the 29th um, at the same time.